I had you. moved to Dublin in 1995, and up to that point, I hadn't lived in the city at all. Um, but and I was coming to the city, having um, grown up 40 miles away, <laughs> uh, and then going to college in the north of Ireland, and then traveling to the traveling around Europe for a short while after I graduated and then ending up in working in a bookstore in Atlanta, Georgia for the best part of a year. And what, wait, uh, which bookstore? It was called Oxford books. Um, okay. And it's like, while I was there it was 1994, 1995. And it was just at that time, Atlanta was getting ready for the Olympics in 1996, but oh, also right. the city was experienced like, the Barnes and Noble was spreading throughout the land of America <laughs> and was moving, had moved into the, into Atlanta while I was there. Borders also moved in where I worked with an independent bookstore, an amazing bookstore, um, family owned. Um, so I worked there for a year, but I wanted to, um, I hadn't lived up in Dublin up to that point. So I kind of felt I have to go and try living in Dublin before I decide what else I'm going to do with my life. But I'd say that during that time, during those travels after I graduated, I was kind of looking for a purpose and um, and what I was going to do with my life, basically. It wasn't clear to me in any way. Uh, but I was interested in, I'd always been interested in reading and I'd always, and I always liked the idea of writing um, myself. And so I came to Dublin and I ended up getting a job through a government kind of employment scheme uh, with the James Joyce Center in Dublin and it was so I worked there I actually did um, I studied business so I I ended up doing their doing their accounts in the beginning and then I became the administrator of the center and uh, I worked there for nearly two years I think and but I was a bit you know restless but wh while I was in there I uh, did a couple a couple of writing workshops at the Irish Writers Centre, which is still running. And then I joined a couple of writing groups and I was trying to write short stories. And I met quite a few people who were in the same situation as I was, or who were trying to get started writing. You know, they were they were writing and they were hoping to get their work out into the world and they were hoping to make some kind of a life in writing. Um, and when we'd sit around, uh, often in a pub, but uh, not always, uh, we would talk about you know opportunities to get published. And there was, a, I'd say, a general air of despondency around the idea of getting published and how difficult it was. And just there didn't seem like people, you know, it seemed to be a real stumbling block for people, and like people were hitting a brick wall in terms of you know the, the, that opportunity. And it, and I didn't know this at the time. I didn't know very much about literary magazines, you know, I hadn't experienced them growing up um, or they weren't on my radar anyway, but, um, and I think it was just a very, it was a fallow period in the kind of history of literary magazines in Dublin. Uh, but all I could see or all we could see the, the group of people who were kind of, I was hanging out with and who were all trying to write and get you know and make that start um all they could see was this void um and i myself and my friend Aoife Kavanagh um so she had she was working with me in the James Joyce Centre and she'd come out of having studied English and philosophy at, uh, in Dublin was from Dublin uh, but had gone to Galway in the west of Ireland and did a master's in publishing over there in literature and publishing so she was keen to uh, investigate the you know possibilities of, of having a career in publishing at that point so we would talk about you know both where we were both coming from in this in this respect and I think at some point we decided that we were going to set up a magazine and we were and really what we wanted to do was you know get people to send us work submit work to us uh, we'd read it we'd decide if it was if we were excited by the work and if we were, depending on how excited we were with, by the work, we'd do an issue, of, we'd put, put out a magazine. Um, and we didn't know very much about 
how to go about doing that other than putting out that initial call the poems and the stories started to come in uh, Wait, can i can i stop you for a second like a question i have is like where did you put the call out was this just online and uh, no well online didn't exist then <laughs> this was i was gonna say uh, right. so it, did, it certainly didn't exist for me uh really i would say like i think i probably set up an email address fairly soon after that but um uh, no, so actually we got a note, we got, we wrote, we got a notice into some of the papers, but there was also the Irish Writers' Centre that I just mentioned were running the courses, so they had a newsletter, so we got it into their newsletter. Um, there was Poetry Ireland, was so they put it in their newsletter. Uh, it was all, you know, these were print newsletters that went out to people, you know, in the, in the real world, uh, <laughs> you know, real format. Um, and we did get a mention in the Irish Times, uh, you know, for the submission call. And there was a kind of snarky mention, if you if you understand snarky, uh, as in, you know, they, they were saying, I think we put in that people didn't have to pay a submission fee. And the person, the, the person who put together this literary column of, of literary news kind of said, well, I should hope not. <laughs> why, why, why would people pay for this? the privilege of their work being read um but you know we were very green and didn't know what we were doing essentially and um but you know we we definitely got enough work that we were excited about and we decided that we do we we, we publish a magazine and we, we we scraped the money together to publish that and we got a printer who was willing to wait until after a while after we he printed the magazine to, to get payments so that we were able to sell copies and then pay pay off the bill. We did sell some advertising in that first issue, which was kind of horrendous experience of trying to sell ads, um, you know, which I hated. Um, but yeah, we we got it done, and um, Aoife and I worked on. The, we decided we'd do a second issue. Um, because you know we'd enjoy doing the first one we had a launch for the first issue and um in the irish writer center and the day like we had a plan for a friday evening and the print the, the magazine arrived from the printers that afternoon like very late but it made it on time and you know the, just the excitement of all that and i i was um i had just turned 27 at that point you know but um yeah i just enjoyed every aspect of it and um i wanted to keep it going Aoife worked on the second issue with me we did that together and then at that point um she was kind of figuring out what she wanted to do next and she decided that she was going to become a teacher so that's what she went off to teacher training college at that point she was probably a few years younger than me um and so i but i wanted to keep going and i guess i i just i by this point pretty much I had discovered that this was something I loved doing. And it was a way for me to to be engaged, involved with the literature world, um, the world of writing, without having the pain of writing myself, you know? <laughs> Which I, kept, I mean, I continued trying to do for the next four or five years. So the next four or five years, I was working on the magazine part-time. I was, I was doing other jobs part-time to bring in actual money for myself. Um, and I was trying to write stories as well. But um, then in 2004, after I'd been doing it for six years, I took a bit of a break. So the magazine kind of stopped for the best part of a year. And while I was trying to figure out what would happen next for me, um, and what I decided to do at that point was um, that I would keep going, that I would come, I was give up the other things that I was doing and I would go at this full time, even though there, there wasn't the funding there. But um, so I was going to commit fully to doing this because it had been frustrating to me to kind of do it in that part time way and to be only part, you know, and to have the other commitments that were taking up more of my time, but that were funding everything else. But so I moved down to where I'd grown up and my brother um, had a house down there um, again 40 miles outside Dublin in the countryside so I lived there for two years my brother was still was living in London so this house was available to me and that's where I and as well as deciding to do this full time 
that's when I also decided that we were going to start publishing books alongside the magazine, which we started doing in 2005 um, as well. So in 2005, May 2005, I would have come back with a kind of a new, slightly new format of the mag for the magazine and this new publishing imprint as well. Okay, so in terms of just logistics, because yeah. there are probably people listening who might have an interest or at least some inkling of an interest in starting their own literary magazine, yeah. in terms of what you needed to know, because you started out and you said you were very green, you were just sort of an enthusiast, mm -hmm. and you and Aoife were kind of just winging it. Yeah. But, you know, it's one thing to find a printer who can print what you've done, but you also, you have to do the layout, you have to be able to do the graphic sure. design, you have to be able yeah. to do the yeah. cover. Or is that a skill set that you possess? Not at the time, <laughs> but uh, and so the cover we've always had help with, but I did learn how to do layout. And I remember again with the very first issue, we um, Eva had arranged for us to go and meet with a publisher who was quite old school, and um, you know, and a lot of this, so much of this is is pre digital anyway. But um, so we're doing the first issue at the start of nineteen ninety eight. But um, I remember going to this publisher's office and she was she had to sit down with a pair of scissors and uh, some you know pieces of paper and you know how do we want the magazine to look and you know we we stick that's what she wanted us to do and I, I but there was a computer over on her desk and I was saying can we not use the computer please <laughs> <laughs> ultimately we need to get this on the computer <laughs> but no she wanted us to play with the scissors and so I, I had to leave that meeting because I am a very very practical person basically <laughs> I, you know I need I need to see things happen and get the, get them done um, but yeah so we and we didn't have the software to do the layout but you know we were at one point, another point, we were in another publisher's office, like towards midnight, kind of borrowing the, their computer to to get the layout done of the first issue. Wow. But yeah, so there, there, there literally was nothing. And then, yeah, but so all of that is kind of like we've had, it's now 25 years on the go. So we've, um, yeah, it's been a build up of resources over time. <laughs> and, and I'm sure like the... I'm sure that the layout and the design of the magazine has obviously changed and evolved as you've gotten sure. more resourced and more sophisticated, right? Yeah. I mean, the first issue would have been A4 and about 24 pages, I think 24, 28 pages. Uh, and the current edition is 240 pages and a bit different. <laughs> Diff different size too? Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's, sorry, this is the most, the start of summer twenty. 23 edition which is just out now and how many uh you do it seasonally like quarterly we're doing it uh we just do two a year now so originally we were doing three a year so that was another thing that changed in 2017 so we we switched it so we started doing we moved from the a4 in 2005 to doing three that were kind of that size but thinner three of those about 120 pages each and then in 2017 i think 2017 we decided that we do we double the size of an issue but we do two of them instead of three and when you say a4 that's the, in reference to the to the layout size is that right yeah yeah so just the yeah so we, that's our standard letter size here but yeah it's quite different in the u.s oh got it okay and then what about uh, you know just basic nuts and bolts uh, nuts and bolts processing of material especially as the magazine has grown larger and more successful and more known within the literary community in Ireland, you yeah, must I have. Back, sorry. I was looking back at a, an old notebook that I had from, from 1997. So the very first issue, and I was, I made a note in this notebook of the su submissions that came in and submissions were arriving into our PO box and I'd go along to the post office and pick them up every week and then come home and log them in this little green notebook. Um, and, you know, but there were, for that first issue, we had 76 submissions come in. Um, and we're, op yeah, at the last issue that we, full submission window that we had for that issue there, um, the summer issue, that's, um, we got 2,900 submissions for that 
all online subjects by a formidable point out. What about like percentage wise in terms of what you what you receive versus what you actually publish? Do you have like a ratio that's pretty standard? Yeah, I mean it's yeah, it's a grim number or something like it's one it's one to two percent, yeah. One, yeah, one to two percent chance of yeah. getting published in the Stingy yeah. Fly based on the volume of submissions that you receive. Yeah, and in terms of, and in, in it's, I mean, this is what an editor does, right? Your the magazine reflects your sensibility and your taste to a degree. Uh, I'm sure there are other editors involved as well, but yeah. is there something like for people listening who are or writers who might be thinking of submitting to you? Is there something that you can point to? that distinguishes work that you guys tend to gravitate toward or is it just excitement you just read it and for some reason you respond to it and each yeah, one is different is very much that i mean so now i've i've moved up like from editing the magazines for the last four or five years uh, and we've had a, a, a series of editors come through uh, so it was just kind of like as the organization kind of grew and and we started doing more and more things it just became too much for me to do so I think the first time I handed over the editing completely was in 2014, which is nine years ago. And then um, we've had a, a series of editors. I had to step back in um, at one point for a, a year or so. But um, yeah, um, it's somebody else now doing the choosing, but we'd have a panel of readers and contributing editors who read some of the submissions as well. I mean, because one person can't get through all of that work. Um, Although, like, when a new editor comes in, they tend to say, okay, give, I'm going to go for this. I'm going to try and read everything. But um, I think after they do that once, <laughs> you know, they realize, okay, well, who else can help us here? Um, but I, I think, you know, and when I was editing, it was the same. Like, you're, you're reading each piece individually and you're, you're, you're trying to assess what the writer is trying to do with this piece of work and and you're giving it as as fair a shot as you can and you want you know you want to find good work and the, you know and the easiest thing in the world is to read something that's that just completely speaks to you and you know that you relate to and you know and you 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 want other people to read this and you want other people to have the same experience that you've had reading it and that's 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 wonderfully exciting, you know, uh, and clear, kind of a clear pathway. But then, not every, you're not going to love every piece that you read by any means. And then you you have to ask, well, what is this writer trying to do? This doesn't appeal to me necessarily. But what are they trying to like? If what they're trying to do is, if they've achieved what they've set out to do, and it's to all intents and purposes a kind of, you know, an achieved piece of work that 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 people will read. I mean, I, like even from very early on in the magazine's history, I remember uh, publishing an issue and people would come up to me afterwards and they'd say that they love this or that piece. And and very, you know, it was always a different piece and it was always, it was very often not a piece that I would have loved, but, um, but I, but I, but it was always affirmation to hear that because it meant, yes, this, this hit home with somebody and I hope that it would because, you know, the, I felt that the writer was doing something interesting and was and it was deserving of being published, you know. Okay, yeah, because I was going to say about having a group of people evaluating submissions, everybody's taste is obviously different. There have to be situations where there might be somebody who's read who really responds to something, but you don't quite respond to it. Yeah. Like, does there have to be consensus or do you allow for different editors to get to kind of assert their taste on the magazines. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, the, the editor in each, uh, like the overall editor of, of the magazines, whoever, whoever is the person at the top at the, at the, at the time. So currently it's Lisa McInerney. Um, so she would have the ultimate say. So the contributing editors would feed work to her that they say, you know, this is worth your time reading. Um, and, but she would make the ultimate call. Um, but I suppose, with that, you know, the fact that we have more, more people involved now, it allows us to, um, to perhaps give better feedback than we were able to do before. I mean, I remember, again, going back to my days of editing the magazine, that like we would have, I would have a clear kind of yes pile, which would be yes, I'm excited to publish this, or uh, yes, uh, this person, this piece of work, 
you know, I feel confident that some readers will enjoy this. Um, you know, and we, we want the magazine to be reflective of what the different types of writing that people are doing at any one time. Um, but then I'd have a no pile, which was quite large, and it would be generally, I think people kind of, I mean, the most common mistake, I suppose, is, is people submitting work before it's ready because, you know, people love, or people need to have deadlines to get work done. Um, and they see our deadline coming up and they say, yeah, I'm going to go for it. Now's the chance. And, you know, and they probably haven't spent as much time with the work as they should have, uh, but they get it in and there's a feeling of the accomplishment of getting the piece submitted. And when you're starting out as a writer, that that's an important part of the process as well, I suppose, just, you know, learning how to, you know, hit deadlines and get work done and get work in. But oftentimes that work is not, perhaps not ready and will benefit from being reworked over time. And that's where the, um, you know, be, us being able to maybe send out more kind of qualitative to rejection letters is helpful. Uh, and also, I suppose, and the other thing I wanted to mention was the fact that, you know, certainly in the early day, there was a, always a significant maybe pile as well. And that was kind of writing that was, I mean, that could be writing that was accomplished, but not quite there yet. Or there was some kind of tricky issue with it. And one of our responses to that was to start doing workshops where we kind of would give people the opportunity to you know, share their work with one another and kind of um, and, and work with a more established writer to kind of um, hopefully iron out some of the issues that was with, that they had with the work. Um, but yeah, we've certainly had people who've um, sent work to us for a number of years before they got published with us. Um, and that's another part of the process as well. And I think it's something that distinguishes um, literary magazines, let's say. That's an important kind of role that literary magazines play. It's like kind of no fault or no judgment kind of rejections of, you know, yeah, submit, submit to us again. Like we've all, we always, our standard response is always said to submit work again because you just never know when something is going to, you know, or when a, for a writer there's going to be a breakthrough and the work will reach a different level. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I relate to that. Just uh, I was a teacher of creative writing at you know college level for a few years, and one of the things that I hated was giving grades. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, just because I feel like, well, these are young writers who are just starting out, and you'd really never know how somebody's going to develop, and you don't want to discourage somebody who would otherwise go on to do great things. I guess sure. you don't want to. I mean, there, there's also maybe a more cynical take where you don't want to encourage people <laughs> who yeah. should do something else. But I don't know. I felt like you need to kind of give people space to make their mistakes and to kind of yeah. develop and maybe nudge them in the right direction if you can. But otherwise, it's a very individual process. And yeah. I think for people who might be interested in submitting, first of all, uh, is it limited only to Irish writers or do you take work from anywhere? Well, no, we take international, like from anywhere, everywhere. Yeah. So okay. Okay, so that's one thing. And then I think a second question that I have related to submission that you could probably speak to well after 25 years is what are some do's and don'ts for literary submission? I'm sure you've gotten all kinds of emails and strange correspondence from writers, you know, when it comes to getting rejected, when it comes to submitting again, when it comes to trying to dialogue with an editor, mm -hmm. what are some do's and don'ts? Um, I think, look, well, I was talking about just now about that rush to get published, uh, which, you know, I think every writer experiences and particularly, I suppose, if, you know, a lot of the writers that come through and this, you know, would be very much true for me as well, like in terms of, you know, I, my family don't like, weren't great readers. Um, a couple of my sisters read, but, um, you know, my parents weren't readers, my you know, wider family you know, books weren't kind of cherished or <laughs> adored in our house. But, um, you know, so I found kind of great um, comfort in, in reading and growing up. And uh, 
but it means i suppose like if you're if you're a writer it could be very isolating as a writer and then if, if if not if the people around you don't understand what it is you're doing or don't put a lot of value in what you are doing i suppose the validation comes from from getting published and you know and because it also you know i think as well when you're starting out as a writer and you say that you're that's if you have the you know if you if you manage to say that out loud to people their reaction will always be or will often be you know are you published like people don't understand um i don't think people understand the world of writing and, and publishing very well yeah i think i mean obviously like it's just i mean if people aren't are showing clearly that they haven't read the guidelines i mean that's kind of a foolish thing to do at this stage because we go to a lot of trouble with the guidelines uh to you know to make them as clear as possible um but yeah i think i mean my very convoluted point about you know just i think writers at this stage because like we're we're talking like we're mostly talking about very early stage writers i mean they have to spend some time figuring out what the type of writer is that who they want to be um and they can see getting published in a magazine as a kind of a, a very important stepping stone for them um and it, yes and that's true it can it can certainly be that but um they also have to you know they also have to to work out how how will they sustain themselves in the work over a long period of time and um you know, so I, all, what I'm really talking about here is is to for people to avoid submitting work before it's, it's too soon, and to and maybe magazines, you know, a magazine might not be for you. I mean, even not everybody can write a short story, um, and some people, like I know novelists here in Ireland who would have, didn't write short stories until well after they published their first novel because they just um, they they the technique and the craft involved in a short story is completely different uh, to writing novels. Um, but that means that, like, but then you also find people who are, like, people will be, you know, putting all of their efforts into writing short stories, even if <laughs> that's not what they should be doing. <laughs> you know, so it's, um, but, you know, like we're very happy to read whatever work comes in, and if we see merit in it whatsoever, we, you know, the dialogue will start with the with a writer, and you know, over time, we'd hope that we'd be able to publish some of their work. Um, but I think, yeah, you have to be like, and but then you have to understand as well that you know, that can take that can take time for you know for a for even, you know, or that there are other magazines. Like when I, again, when I was talking earlier, I was talking about how there were very few magazines in Ireland when we started out. But like at the now, in the last 10 years, there's been a real kind of growth and flourishing of literary magazines in Ireland. And, and they're both in print and online. You know, like 15 years ago, 15, 20 years ago, people were saying that print was over, whereas, if that's not the case, I mean, print seems like certainly in Ireland, print is flourishing again. Um, so the outlets are there. There's plenty of places. There's so there. That means there are plenty of editors. So like the single fly may or may not be for you. So again, it's like kind of, you know, as much as possible finding out, like reading the work that's that that a magazine publishes and knowing what it is that an editor likes, but but not. Um, I'm not in any way saying that you that that should make you change what you write because the most exciting thing for us is to get something that feels like that no other person in the world could have written this except for this author. So those are the writers that we are looking for, the people who 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 are writing what they want to write, come what may, and you know it's up to us to recognise the value in that. But um, but yeah, it, but that's the work that that is going to surprise us and challenge us, and that we will want to share with readers because it will surprise and challenge them too, hopefully. Um, so well, what no... and 
Well, and I was going to say, and what what about the quality, and what about the quality of submissions as the magazine has grown and evolved? You said I think you had like seventy nine submissions or whatever it was for that first edition in your PO box, and then now yeah. you're getting close to three thousand or whatever it is. And yeah. I'm wondering about like how the quality of the work that you receive has or has not changed through the years. Um, I think it has. I think it has changed. I mean, I think it has. I think it has generally gone up. I would say. I mean, like another like another thing that has changed in Ireland, and I think changed to a large degree, you know, internationally as well. Is 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 how a writer is made, and how a writer, or how a writer's career is made, and how how a writer's career can progress um like so when we set up it, that same year of 97 1998 i think was the first year of the first ever master's program in creative writing in ireland so and which was run by trinity college um and now um nearly all of the universities in in ireland have their own creative writing departments or courses or a master's program um and, and some of them have um you know that at undergraduate level as well so um yeah so that's changed completely i think and so so therefore for more people write creative writing is an option and so they are looking they're they're looking for how to you know how to progress in in this you know it, what the opportunities they are are there for them and one of those opportunities are obviously or one of the pathways for them is to start publishing in literary magazines um and so i think you know like so i'd say there's a whole different approach to writing now uh, than there was 25 years ago in ireland for sure and probably in other places uh and we also run our own workshop program as well. But, um, but yeah, so like, I think, so I don't think it's impacted on the type of story that's been written or the type of work that's been produced. Uh, like, I, but I do just think that there's more work. And then if people, if there were, and there, there are more people who've had the experience of sharing their work with peers and um you know taking in feedback and so uh, that has to lead to a more polished kind of submissions for us mm -hmm. and what about the purpose of literary magazines because you know you guys have a relatively small subscriber base or a very small depending on how what you're comparing it to but how many people subscribe about a thousand yeah, it actually went up a little bit recently, but yeah. Okay. <laughs> so it's about 1,250 or so, yeah. Yeah, so the, but it's an interesting point because the influence that your magazine has on Irish literary culture and on international literary culture is outsized by comparison. And yeah. I think it's useful to underline that because you can have a big impact without having you know, these huge numbers that I think people normally associate with huge impact. Yeah. So yeah. like, I'm just curious to hear you talk about the purpose of a literary magazine and the function that it serves for writers and readers within maybe the broader political ecosystem. Mm. I think, I mean, one of the main things is, is providing community, you know, uh, to, to writers at any one time in any one place. I mean, I think, and that's, it's kind of essential to, to how we have endured, I think, and how like the the place we've kind of st staked for ourselves here in in Ireland uh, is that you know we've we've had launches for each issue as it comes out, and that means bringing together now in these the even in that first issue there were probably twenty writers in in the issue, um, and now in but and. The fiction we were publishing then was like very short. It was less than two thousand words or something like that, you know. Um, whereas now there's typically between around 40, 45 in each issue 
now and we we bring them together so we'll have a launch um we had one last saturday night here in dublin um you know where people get to read some of the contributors get to read but they all get to meet whoever can make it to that launch but we've also started doing zoom events for for the contributors of each issue as it comes out kind of happened during the pandemic so we had to do those but now we've kind of kept, kept them going just again as a way of all of the contributors in in the magazine coming together for a few hours and just talking a little bit about their work and you know and I think that's and there'll be writers in an issue that have been writing for 25 years or 30 years there'll be writers who have just started in the last two years um so that's but they all get a chance to hear from each other and about each other's work um so I, you know that's so such a crucial part of what a literary magazine is and does um that's kind of giving you know like again i was talking about the validation that we are you know, like that the, the, the early stage writer is 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 desperately looking for and that sense of community you know from people people who will understand what it is to try to want to be a writer you know will understand their ambition will understand or will want to talk about books with them you know it's like so so all of that is becomes available i think or can be made available to our contributors by our you know the interest that we take as a, like it's now a team of people working on the magazine with me um, like we spend a lot of time trying to figure out like how do we how do we best encourage writers and how do we make things easier how do we reduce barriers for people um you know how, like what supports can we extra supports could we put in place that and opportunities can we make available um for writers that will help them kind of through that very kind of difficult path of um you know starting out as a writer we did a couple of zoom events in the last last year i think it was um where it was and we build them for for writers for people who just wanted to get started as writers and they could sign up for free and just come and talk and a we had a group of writers who were going to share their experiences of starting out and well, what we noticed in the audience for those events, which we had probably about a couple of hundred people at, at the two events, but um, was that people signed up for them who we'd already published and then people who were like, but also people who just started out and people like people who'd already made some kind of progress because that thing of starting out as a writer, that, that period of time, it's 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 a it could, could be quite long <laughs> you know as in you know and there are people at very different stages within that but they would all you know but most of them would still be waiting you know working towards their first book but that could be anything from you know two to 15 years in for a person that their first book comes out um so I think you know so a literary magazine if like one of the things i used to say to myself very, in, in the very early days when it was just me working on the magazine for a long period of time it was just me um it'd be i would say i would say what can a literary magazine do what you know and it was and it was and i partly i was just you know say well a literary magazine can do all kinds of things you know so like there's no you know but as in there's no I shouldn't limit what what we set to, out to do because you know if there's a need for something to be done a lot of what we've we've developed over time is is kind of you know through talking to writers listening to writers most of the people involved on the editorial side all our contributing editors all our you know all the people I've brought in as to edit the magazine be that as guest editors or the people who have now worked as editors they they've all been writers themselves, so they're kind of very tuned into what writers are looking for from a magazine or would want from a magazine, uh, and what what are the you know what are the stumbling blocks for writers? What are the opportunities that writers need uh, to help them? And so you know that's that that informs what we do, what we try to do. Well, and you guys have had I think this is one of the 
things that distinguishes the stinging fly is the track record that you have finding good work by writers who go on to have big careers, but you're getting them early. You're locating yeah. that talent early. You have a good eye for talent. I'm, I mean, some of this is just intuition. Some of it is being well-read and having good taste. Is there anything else you can point to? Because it's, I mean, it started with you, but it obviously it's branched out editorially through the years as the magazine yeah. has grown. What is the secret to finding this work? I guess part of it is the fact that they're sending it to you, but you also yeah. have to recognize, recognize it when you see it, right? Yeah. And uh, like, uh, again, going back, like a, a big input, uh, like a big part of the impulse in setting up the magazine in the first place was to encourage sh short story writers because that's, I mean, that's what I was trying to write myself. But, um, but also there was the fear that, uh, and I've heard this spoken about by, you know, American writers too, the fear that if there aren't outlets for the short story, that it will, you know, the, the, the writers will move away from the form and it will perish. Um, you know, and that, and like we have a great tradition of short story writing um, here in in Ireland. And, you know, so I didn't want to see that happen. So, I mean, a big part of it was to provide the opportunity for short story writers. And then to have the magazine where you can see, like, we published a writer called Danielle McLaughlin, um, like, like the, her first encounter with the magazine was with submitting work to us and me saying no. Um, and then I think she said more work and I said, um, no, but I'd like to see another story, another, or send me another couple of stories outside of the submission window. Um, and so she did, and she sent two stories and um, one of them, I said, we'll publish this. And this was in 2011, I think. Um, and then, and then a while later, I heard from her and she said, I've written another story, but it's much longer than anything I've written before. And I'm really proud of it. But I think it's probably too long for you because it's 5000 words. And I was, you know, my reaction was no, I mean, if this is the story you're really proud of, this is the story I want to read. So please do send this to me. And when I read that story, it was called a story called Night of the Silver Fox. Um, I, yeah, I knew that we could publish a collection by Danielle if, if I got, you know, seven or eight more stories that were of a similar quality and had a similar impact on me. And that would probably be mostly an emotional impact. Um, you know, so I, that's, the conversation I had with her, you know, write more of these longer stories, get on with it. Um, so she did, and to, into two thousand, like two thousand and fifteen, she published her book of stories with us, and then, all, but also it was published with Random House in in the US. And between her sending me that story, that first longer story, um, and two thousand and fifteen, she'd also published two stories in the in the New Yorker. So. You know, she was <laughs> she was a talent, but um, but it was like she she like over the lifetime of the magazine, I definitely like and you know she ha wasn't writing when we set up the magazine, but like she probably started writing seriously for herself, um, in maybe two thousand and eight, two thousand and nine, I would say, and then a couple of years later she was in the magazine, and then three or four years later she's in the New Yorker and she's publishing her first book. But um, so it's a, a talent like that, when you see them, when you see it, them come through, I think it's it's fairly obvious that um, that it's a story from a person like that really stands out, and I think will always stand out. Um, and then we're in the kind of like I'm in the privileged position or of being able to take a writer who comes through the magazine with a first story like that and and. Um, Talk, start talking to them about a collection of stories and like we have seen a number of our um collections have come through the magazine in that way where it, and then it's been a kind of slow build up you know from that first story towards a collection over time where i'd be reading the work as they produce it and kind of yeah and that's that's been fantastic i mean a very enjoyable experience for me and that, Luckily enough, I still get to do some of that, you know. Hmm.
And some of the other writers, I mean, Sally Rooney is a prominent one who published with you guys early in her career and has gone on to great things. Yeah. Uh, Kevin Barry, like who are some other writers that people uh, would know about who maybe got their start or published with you early on? Um, well, yeah, so Sally Rooney sent us poems when she was in still in high school, effectively. But and then by the time we published them, she had started in Trinity College. Uh, and then she pub yeah, so she published poems with us for a while. Um, and then we published Colin Barrett. Colin Barrett would have been somebody who, um, He's published two collections now with Grove Atlantic in the States, um, but he would have started doing the creative writing masters in UCD and sending us work uh, and us working together towards the first collection after we published the first story by him. Uh, we published uh, Claire Louise Bennett, who's published um, Pond and Checkout 19 with Riverhead in the US, I think. So yeah, people, um, Sometimes the writers uh, that we publish in book form, they may not have an agent or, or they'll get an agent sometime after they appear in the magazine um, or before, around the time we publish a book by them. And then it's great to see that they move on to international publishers um, after we publish them first. And, you know, so like and we are essentially there to give them pe people that first opportunity. Uh, especially around short stories because and again this is changing somewhat in the UK and in Ireland in the sense that um, publishers had kind of shied away from publishing collections of stories uh, up until maybe the last four or five years where they're now appearing more regularly on, on the bigger publishers lists as well um, as well as you know obviously debut novels are still gold dust <laughs> Well, you know, it's it's another function that the literary magazine performs yeah. in addition to providing community for the writers. It is also a way for people in the industry yeah. to locate talent and yeah. to kind of scout yeah. talent. It's a, I'm going to use a sports analogy, an American sports analogy, but it's a kind of farm system. Like this is like a baseball, <laughs> but yeah. basically like, a, you know, a minor league team or like young talent coming up through the ranks. If you work in publishing in an editorial capacity and you're trying to find the next Sally Rooney or whatever, you keep an eye on the literary magazines that are yeah. doing it well and that have a good eye for talent. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. And that is definitely happening with us. We get, um, we've, the last few years we've noticed like agents will contact us about writers who appeared to, in the issue um last year we did an issue a separate uh, yeah an issue that was going to be for all new writers so everyone in in the magazine or in that issue of the magazine was somebody we hadn't published before then uh in in the previous 24 years so uh and then so we have a good mix in that of people um who um were literally just starting out again or or people who maybe would have been trying to you know have, had submitted work to us before or maybe people who were discouraged um about submitting work and you know that's a, another big thing that i think that will we we certainly try to do is to kind of think about who is not submitting work to us or you know who might not be because you know there, there is there is one group of people who you know any opportunity that comes along, they, they're on it. And then th there's the group of people, and some of them, the suspicion certainly that I would entertain is that some very talented writers have been knocked back for whatever reason and may not be putting their work forward. And so we have to kind of try and make sure that we're, you know, we're, we're being as encouraging to them as we possibly can so that, you know, um that you know that we stand a, ch a good chance of, of that they will submit work to us because they see that, that the, the kind of the level of care that we 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 give to this you know well and about about, like, about the function of having to reject writers yeah. who submit their work you have you have to have form letters when you're dealing with the volume that you're dealing with yeah. but then as you've kind of alluded to so far, there are different tiers. There are writers who are in the maybe pile or writers whose work in which you sense like real possibility if they fix a few things or evolve a little yeah. bit more. So 
I'm just curious to know about handling that part of it, because I think from a writerly perspective, it can obviously be frustrating to submit your work and then hear nothing at all. That often happens. Is there a policy in place at the Stinging Fly where you you do respond to each and every person, but maybe with differing degrees of attention, depending on the quality well, of the work? I mean, that's, that's... Yeah, I mean, I, like there have been times when we haven't been able to get back to everybody or when I was just wasn't able to do it all. And, you know, so certainly at different points early on, um, you know, it just was not possible for me to get back to everybody and then too much time would have passed. And yeah, it was, uh, and it was, uh, so I'm very glad that we kind of moved beyond that stage <laughs> of our development. Um, and, you know, there was a time when we weren't able to pay writers either, you know, but, um, but yeah, so we do have, like, there would be, like, everybody would now get a response. And that that's obviously made so much easier. I mean, by using a platform like Submittable, where, um, you know, it's, it's part of the package that you can, you know, send out a response to everybody at different stages and including the rejection letters. Um, so it's easier, much easier to communicate with people um on mass um but definitely we'd have you know like people would now get a c communication like so there might be um let's say a, a different email might go to um anyone who featured in, in in the long list for the editor and that that long list could be up to 120 stories of the 1500 or whatever that were read um and then, you know, the top 60 or the, and then again, the top 30 might get a different one. And then, the, you know, and, and because now, you know, we have an editor who, whose job it is to edit the magazine and the, you know, and, and my job and other people's job is to kind of, you know, to make sure everything else is in place so that they can just get on with doing that. It means that. Uh, Lisa is now in a position to to spend more time, you know, with the rejection letters um, and with that process. And then also, it might be a process of saying, of you know, asking to see another draft of something or working on an author over time, you know, to say, well, actually, I, you know, this needs work. If you're willing to work with me on it, uh, it might go in, into an issue next year, not into the next issue. We'll hold hold it back. And we'll work a bit more on it together. Um, so, you know, I think we're definitely interested in investigating all the kind of thing, everything we can possibly do to help a writer in that way. Um, you know, so and and yeah, I'm I'm very pleased at, at, by the fact that you know that we've gotten this far. That you know that it's not a case of you know having to send out blanket rejection letters or um or not even getting to do that at all because you have so much other stuff to get done listen i, I sort of deal with this like as the host of this show in terms of getting yeah. pitched you know i get pitched a lot and it's yeah it's just me and i think like when it comes to correspondence when you're in that situation there have to be systems in place it's not simple yeah. like to develop those systems and to make sure that everybody's getting responded to and yeah. to manage the volume just day after day it's like it's too yeah. much you know at a certain point so i can understand how it would take time and yeah. a question i have as well you know on a related note having read so many submissions through the years having done this for what almost 3 decades at this point you must have a very finely tuned sense of the short story as a form and an understanding of what it is that makes a short story work. I don't know if it's something you can articulate. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, a lot of this stuff is intuitive and that you go by feel and emotion, but mm -hmm. you mentioned earlier that the short story is a form that differs from the novel and it requires different things of a writer and not all writers have that skill set. They might be, you know, more suited for a longer form, but mm -hmm. for people listening, is there something or are there things that you can point to in short stories that tend to make them effective? Do you have any way of defining what it is that makes a good short story and a good short story writer? Mm, oh, <laughs> I wish I had the answer to this question. I mean, a while ago we started, um, 
we started doing a spreadsheet where we um were logging the submissions uh you know this is even the one like the ones as we read them we were logging them and we were kind of you know putting in kind of logging details like you know point of view um location time frame just you know to get a sense of of what type of stories were coming in and then and and would that lead to us kind of having the, the answer to maybe this question of it, but it hasn't <laughs> it right. just has led to a, a very long kind of spreadsheet but uh, of, yeah. of, of details about stories that came in but um so yeah if like you just you really do just know when when you're reading it you know and it's but like i love the Amer the best american short story series and one of the things I love about that is I don't get I don't always get in each year, but you know if I, actually when I'm whenever I visit America, that's kind of one of the things I'll go looking for in a bookstore is is older copies of that and from different years. But um, and then you have a guest editor each year, and they're they're you know there's an introduction telling you about what what a short story, what they love about short stories, and um, and, and what makes a good short story. Um, but I, a few years ago, Elizabeth Stroud did it, and um, I th she had a lovely thing where it was she was talking about it's like getting a phone call in the, you know in the days when there wasn't caller ID and it was you know that tentative thing of picking up the phone and not knowing who it was going to be, and then and then if it was a, cert a certain if yes and depending on who it was you know you would i you know would be either i have to get off this phone really quickly you know i can't bear to talk to this person or it's just that your whole body relaxes and you go okay you know whatever this is going to be you know this person is going to just this is going to be a real treat to, to hear from this person uh and that's what it is like you know i think opening or picking up a story and reading the first couple of paragraphs it's because as an editor, what you're doing, I think, is you're looking at you're t like you're reading and you're going, what is this? You know, the, the questions are flying through your head as to what is this person trying to write about? Who you know, what's happening here? Uh, who who is this? Uh, what are they writing about? Um, who is this character? Um, what are they doing now? Um, you know, but the good writer will just deliver and uh, and immediately i think your body relaxes and you start to just read for pleasure or excitement or you know it's 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 the the questioning switches off and it's um because i think as well when you're reading that amount of material what you're trying to do is find reasons to say no to something um and whereas and so when the good stuff comes through it's just it's just going hang on a minute yes <laughs> you know it's like forget about forget all your questions this is a story um and you need to listen to this now and forget you know you need to forget everything else because you know i've written a story and here it is and that's the message you're getting as opposed to you know the kind of the frantic kind of reading and guess second guessing what is going on and um so it's it's that feeling of the, this person is not in control of the material uh, that you get when you're reading the work that isn't going to make it into the magazine whereas it's the 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 sheer relief and pleasure that comes when you know that this person is in control of the material and they have produced the goods and here it is and you can you can definitely without you know and you can do it with joy and excitement you can pass this on to readers because they'll have you know you hope that they will have the same experience yeah well yeah. i think like i love the i love the the point that you made about being in questioning mode yeah. when you're reading trying to sort out what a writer is up to and yeah. how the hallmark of something that is really accomplished and really good and ready for the magazine is that that questioning just stops. Yeah. And I can relate. I think anybody who's in a position where they're reading a lot, I, I think anybody who loves to read a book 
loves reading something that really excites them and that is yeah. an absolute pleasure and that is totally absorbing. I like to think that for people like you and maybe for people like me who are constantly fielding books and reading, that the pleasure is maybe a little bit greater. <laughs> like the, the, the joy that you get when you're reading a book and it's not work. Yeah, Do you yeah. know what I'm saying? Like you just, it's like, you just relax into it and it's like, oh, this is yeah. a delight. I'm looking forward to finishing this. Like I'm not even yeah. looking at the clock or thinking about yeah. what else I have to do. And, you know, that is a writer who is in command and it is really, really hard to define what exactly it is. I mean, that spreadsheet that, that, uh, that you, that whatever, the eternal spreadsheet that you developed, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can't, you can't really define it. You just know it when you, when you read it. And yeah, it's, yeah. it's also, I think, related to this idea that you mentioned earlier about wanting to find work that only the writer himself or herself could possibly mm. have written yeah. something yeah. so individual, something so unique, something so connected to who this person fundamentally is. And that can take on all sorts of different shapes. And when it's rendered well, when the time and the effort have been expended in service yeah. of the work. Yeah that's what it takes. And I want to know too, a little bit more about the way that you sustain this magazine financially. I think American listeners in particular, where funding for the arts is maybe not so robust or so friendly, might be amazed and perhaps a little bit despondent to learn that you guys do receive considerable funding from the Arts Council in Ireland. Is that that's correct? Right. Yeah, we do. Uh, we do now. Um, yeah, so over time, that's built up um, quite a bit, and um, yeah, I, but I, and that is subject, obviously, to um, you know what is happening generally in the economy and and politically as well. But um, but certainly over the last few years, we're in a good place. I think um, I think the Arts Council kind of recognized like at the beginning, the Arts Council weren't sure about <laughs> what we were doing. And, uh, you know, it took a while for us to convince them that what we were doing was good and worthwhile. Uh, but they did, that did change at some point. And um, so they've supported us consistently over time. And, um, and then we had, like the Arts Council itself would have been building up its the amount of funding it was getting um, as our the Irish economy grew during our the first ten years of the magazine, uh, and then the economy tanked like as the world economy did in around two thousand and eight two thousand and nine, and then there was a dip for a few years, and then it built up again, and then the Arts Council um, got more fun like arts funding went up during the pandemic because uh, the government decided that arts funding was something that was worth investing in at that time. I mean, could and could make a difference, I suppose, maybe with people at home. And then also the number of people who are employed with the art, within the arts to keep their jobs secure, I suppose. Um, and yeah, to provide kind of entertainment and um, comfort for people during lockdown, that the arts could deliver on that. Um, yeah, so I think like so funding increased then as well, and um, and then this like the singing fly as an organisation has gone through the a process of you know incorporating as a company, and we're seeking charitable status here, which will you know like so I I guess this means that um, it it no longer relies on me to um, for it. Well, hopefully this means that it can continue if I decide to walk away from it. That there's a you know there's, a, there's an organisation now in place that and it's not dependent on me uh, that will continue this work um, should I decide to put my feet up at some point sure. uh, in the next years. But uh, you know, so that that's a great relief to me as well. But yeah, so the, but definitely the um, there is more funding available i mean i remember i went to i visited um minnesota a few years ago and uh as things happened a friend brought me along to um a fundraiser that milkweed were ha running milkweed the publishers there and i was kind of amazed by that because you know they were having an auction for you know 
lunch with a poet for five thousand dollars and uh this type of thing and, you know, but and then i understood that they you know that they would do maybe one of these a year the big dinners and um that's where they, that's what their annual funding was basically you know whereas we have to fill in a lot of application forms and uh yeah uh but it it does deliver it keeps us going and you know it's uh, and it's allowed the singing fly now so there's um there's myself working full-time one other full-time person working on it who just started in the last month or so and then three part part-time people so it's yeah it's a good team of people now which i think will probably develop a bit more over, over the next while and um we also get funding from the T.S. Eliot Foundation, um, which is also very gratefully received. Sure. Well, I mean, like in terms of just like the practical issue of being able to survive, being able to yeah. publish and distribute a magazine, yeah. you're you're distributing it to physical bookstores and newsstands yeah. all around Ireland. So you have to have that sorted out. You're also paying your yeah. contributors and paying them yeah. pretty well uh, like uh, yeah. according to the standards of literary magazines generally and yeah we've been able to do that too yeah which is yeah it's all, it's all good yeah so just in terms of keeping this thing afloat and keeping it profitable and moving forward you have the funding from the government which is what a couple hundred thousand i think i read in the new york times piece a couple hundred thousand dollars a year or something yeah, so like that year, we're getting two hundred thousand euro which is uh, around that figure in dollars as well but they're roughly equivalent um and yes but that so our funding has increased probably it's probably doubled over the last um three to four years as we went through the process of becoming a company and so on Okay, so there's the government funding, the T.S. Eliot Foundation. There is the subscribers who you know yeah. pay an annual fee to subscribe, and so that generates some revenue. Uh, advertising. We don't do, no. See, I, I mean, I, I, it was so painful doing it for those first few issues that I just haven't gone back to it. I mean, it used to, yeah. I mean, now I suppose we could hire somebody in who would be like, you see people who are good at selling advertising and they're good at selling advertising they can do it i just can't um but yeah it would take me yeah. um three days to try and build up the you know the courage to ask somebody to buy an ad and then it takes you three days to recover when they said no yeah, right it take you know it's a lot of it's a, it's a full-time job to do yeah, that yeah. sort of stuff like to go out and try to hustle up ads and to talk to people and then to deliver on the ads yeah. to coordinate the design all that kind of stuff it's a big right. job so uh i'm just curious like beyond the government funding and the foundation funding and the subscri subscription revenue. Is there anything I'm missing just so that listeners who might be wanting to start a magazine can get a sense of what the different channels are that they might want to pursue. Acknowledging yeah, the, fa acknowledging the fact that in the United States, the government funding might not be as robust, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And for, like, but I think there's, there's, there's a much bigger tradition of philanthropy in the States, which is something, um, they're trying to encourage more and more here but um but like from the early days we had a kind of we had a patron scheme which uh, you know involved like people who wanted to support the magazine above and beyond taking an annual subscription and they paid a small amount of money ex so it's just an extra amount of money but so that was certainly a good you know steady source of income um that you know is still there and i think you know it's probably something we'll develop some more in the next couple of years as well because you know it it will help fund a lot of the additional work that we're doing now around writer development the workshops that we run and the mentoring we provide and all of that you know oh uh, wait 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 that's that's right like in addition to the foundational support the government support the subscription revenue you're also it, a publisher you're yeah. publishing books and then you're yeah. also running workshops and yeah. uh, doing mentoring so that's got to generate yeah. revenue as well right some of that generates revenue yeah 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 so the mentoring is mostly we we provided that for free to people but uh to a small set of writers each year um but the workshops do kind of you know will bring in some income we run a summer school now which 
again during the pandemic we um we we were running in-person workshops and then we switched those to online workshops and then post pandemic we're doing both because you know we could see that um you know it was a great demand into like both actually also around ireland from people who didn't wouldn't be able to travel to dublin for the workshops but appreciate us doing them online as well so yeah hmm. and the and the mentoring just to like drill down a little bit more on this like you guys will hand select authors who you feel are close and that yeah, will yeah. have great potential or, their work I mean, has potential a lot of cases there are people who will have already published in the magazine uh, but we're helping them kind of reach the next stage beyond that so it's like whatever project that they happen to be working on we'll pair them with another writer and um and we were doing this on a kind of individual ad hoc basis with you know a, a writer occasionally here or there uh, but what we've started doing is putting that together as a, in a program um, and, um, you know, bringing the, a small group, four, four or five writers together and giving them some kind of group workshops as well as the individual mentoring that they get. I mean, so my colleague, Thomas Moritz, I know has been mentioned on this podcast before when you were talking to Chetna Maru. Uh, oh, right. So, I was going to mention uh, Chetna because she was mentored, wasn't she? Yeah. by? She, yeah, she what well, she she came to our summer school, and then I think after that um, was mentored by Th Thomas Morris. But that was I think they arranged that separately from the work he he wasn't working with us at that point, other than uh, as the workshop leader. Um, but now he's come on board in the last couple of years. He's come back to us. <laughs> back he's been subsumed back into the family and is now our editor at large so he is he is running our mentoring program now yeah oh great yeah i love chetna's book that is a beautiful yeah, book yeah. uh what about like for people listening who might want to submit but also people who might have an interest in starting their own magazine i'd be interested to hear you talk about the editorial process when somebody gets a yes and what in general the editorial process entails at the stinging fly i i have to believe that it's lovely to get a story where you feel like it's almost all done <laughs> you know it's great and usually i think when a writer as we've talked about is in command of the work there usually isn't a ton to do yeah. but are there instances where the work is like 75% of the way there and the, in the editorial process, you get it the rest of the way. Like, what does it look like for somebody who gets a yes to work with you in an editorial capacity? Um, I would say that like, in my experience, most of the work that we published would probably be 80 to 90% there, uh, you know, and so it's, I would say, if if it's if it's any less than that um like if it's if it's 60 to 70 percent there <laughs> i'd be saying to them you know i think you need to do another run at this yourself and come back to us with it but 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 we could be very excited by work that we read that is 60 to 70 percent there and but um but they, we would probably pass it back to the author to have another go at it. or or we'd have a conversation with them and see, you know, where they're where they are at in, in their thinking on the piece, and you know, if they have ideas about how they can develop it. Um, but uh, and and that might be a person who needs mentoring um, as well. But um, but then the eighty to ninety percent ready, and then I think that's going to be less about this story needs something major work done it like we just need to you know do several rounds of line line edits on this and then and copy edits and proofreads and yeah but um i think yeah it would be it would be just suggestions that we're making i mean that's certainly how i operate you know it'd be at that stage you'd have a um a google doc or a word document that you are passing back and forth and with comments on them and, and queries on the text and um and then it, 
it can also help to show the writer the text and layout because they you know their attitude might change to it once they see it and lay it as well um but generally it's you know i think for the most part like we do occasionally get encounter a writer who says i don't want to be edited and we've we've let a couple of right i mean it's very few but like i'd say possibly one hand i can count them all in the 25 years but there have been those writers that um and a couple of you know yeah that we've had to let a story go because we you know they they just don't want to be edited um but for the most part it's a process where we are making suggestions and they come back to us with responses and you know I would feel like I, I, I have a very light editorial touch, I would say myself, in terms of, you know, I don't want to turn the piece into something something that doesn't sound like this writer has written it. You know, I want to, res I want to tune in. I want, first of all, to tune into what the writer is, is trying to do. And, and then I'm kind of suggesting points where, where I've been taken out of the story for whatever reason. And has the author considered this before um this you know this point that i've i've made and sometimes it's like something that they that they're aware of that they tried to fix themselves or or maybe hope that they might get away with or 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 that they have been trying to fix and they couldn't figure it out but you know they've let it slide and so then we talk a bit about that and try and, and come up with something but you know i think I love line edits myself because it's just it really is I think about that tuning into what the p person is trying to do and, and following the sentence and um and 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 you know taking out any interference um you know and that's I enjoy it. and I you know so I still get to do that when we're publishing books because that's what I'll be doing with an author if, we're, if I'm publishing a collection by them well, you know, I, I, I want to ask a, a kind of nuts, another nuts and bolts question, but I think yeah. it's so vital and it has to do with copy editing, you know, copy editing yeah. and making sure that the product that you're putting out isn't riddled with usage errors. And you see this too much in book publishing. Yeah. I feel like maybe copy editing has gotten short shrift in certain quarters and that bothers me. I'm wondering how you manage that. It's also something from, I mean, you guys are at a stage now where you have funding and you, you have probably have budget to have your issues properly copy edited, but especially yeah. for small presses, you know, small presses who are operating yeah. on a shoestring and are trying to auction off dinners with poets to pay for their, yeah, you know, yeah, to yeah. pay for their books and everything. Copy editing can be pricey and it's yeah. obviously slow. It's not sexy work, right? To sit there yeah. and go through yeah. line and, by line. You know, so and I find that when I'm doing like, so I suppose what I'm doing is a mix between line editing, and copy editing, and then we finally a proof reader come in at the very end, but you just have to go and you have to possibly read the story, you know, how many times you have to read it, but like, and each time you read it, you, you're going to notice something else new that, you know, you know, oh, okay. How do I, how did, how did I miss that? And then the proofreader will, will find things again. So, it really does require you to go through that um, as as really as often as you can stomach. Um, and but like we'd be very forgiving as well of, of that those type of edits when you know or those errors or mistakes or typos or whatever when we're first reading the manuscript because they don't matter. Like that is what we will we know that we will have time to fix those. Um, over, you know, and we will give it the time and the effort to to get as many of those fixed up as possible, but they still sink in, or they still slip into an issue at the end of uh, at the end of all that process, and it's re very very annoying. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> you see them still there, but uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I know, I've been there, and I uh, I know that writers have different approaches, you know, within their own work. Some writers like to use quotation marks for dialogue; other writers don't. Some writers yeah. use commas in a kind of grammatically doctrinaire sense, other writers prefer not to. Do you have a house style that you insist your writers adhere to? No, not 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 a very 
not a very invasive one, if that's the right word. But uh, yeah, so we have a house, like we follow some house style. There are elements of house style that we follow, but it wouldn't it wouldn't demand that people use quotation marks if they've chosen not to. So you know we'd accept that, but it would it would if you are using quotation marks, they will be single quotation marks because that's what we use. That's what yeah. I prefer. But I mean, like America, <laughs> it's the devil. I'm just like, yeah, I don't even use them at all lately. But I, well, you know, we'll see. Yeah. But uh, what about this? Uh, you know, the press that you run, the books that you publish. It sounds like it's an or organic process, typically, where the magazine feeds the press. But can you just talk? in a little bit more detail, like what is the press? What's it called? How do people submit? How does that part of the business work? Um, so yes, it's called the Sting and Fly Press. Where did we come up with that name? <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, and it started in 2005, but it, it was very organic that move because we I noticed that there were writers coming through the magazine who, you know, Again, it was like it was the next brick wall that they were hitting um, was that it was hard for them to get a short story collection published, even though they, they'd, you know, they so a couple of people had been, you know, appearing in the magazine um, a few times, and um, but there was nowhere to go for them next. And it was the reluctance at that time generally about publishing collections of stories. Um, so the way to resolve that was to set up a press that has mostly focused on collect, publishing collections of stories and has mostly um, been writers who came to us through the magazine. Um, and yeah, so we don't have a submission process for it. It's like, you know, if somebody inquires about it, it would be, you know, have we seen your work in the magazine? Uh, have you sent your work to the magazine? That's where you start. And then if, you know, and, I would take the view, I suppose, and certainly for the press, um, that you know, anything we publish, uh, so the individual stories in the collection all have to be of a standard that they um, would find a home in the magazine if we had room for all of them, you know. Uh, so uh, that's kind of just how that operates. It's so it's, and it's been yeah, it's been. A lot of debut authors who've come through the magazine for the most part um and then actually in the last couple of years it's changed a little bit in the sense that um like the book that we're publishing in next month is is a writer that we've published for the last 20 years but we've started by publishing her poetry then she published a couple of collections of poetry and then she went on, on to write a novel well, that was published here in Ireland um, about 10 or 12 years ago. But she then started writing short stories, and we published a few of those over the years. So now we're publishing what would be effectively her fourth book as an author, but um, it's her first book of stories. Um, and we have um, we've published a sec two books of stories by an author just because I love working with her. Wendy Erskine is her name. Uh, so it was a writer from Belfast who actually came and did one of our workshops uh, that we we run a six month workshop as well. Um, so she came and did that, was coming down from Belfast to Dublin, um, doing a round trip every Monday evening for six months. And I got to read one of her stories um, and really liked it. It went into the magazine and I had the conversation with her, you know, more of these and there will be a book and you know, and there was. <laughs> and then That's the, the, the dreamed book. about conversation. More of these and there will be a book. That's what authors yeah. want to hear, right? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. Well, if if there are people listening, well, first of all, is there anything that we didn't cover? that you think is vital that we should have covered? I feel like we got a pretty good overview of what you're up to, but if there's anything I missed, uh, feel yeah, free to, suppose, to chime um, in. Like one of the things that we also kind of think a lot about is how, when a writer is starting out, that the, um, you know, that they feel that, that publishing is such a kind of the, the mysterious, industry or dark art of publishing or editing and 
but I suppose to understand that it's you know that it's mo- like I I listened to the episode you did with the agent um the agent one hundred one um a few a while back but you know that was great because one of the things we've been thinking about is when when an agent approaches us um to talk to one of the writers in the magazine like what do we like should what information do we give to the writer about agents like because the agent like how does how does the writer know how to talk to an agent <laughs> how do they know what questions to ask um because even though all the information is out there now on the internet it's it still seems to be like people have a lot of there's a big block there in terms of people thinking that um there's more to the industry than you know there's they think there's some secret code <laughs> that will gain them access as opposed to and maybe it's because the work itself is so hard and so lonely and so you know to get through but that is the that that is the necessary part that has to be done and i do think i think i think the writers writers who produce books somehow understand that that is a necessary part of the process you know they, and they get on with the work um and then they come looking for help um but what do you what so I, wait a minute really just want... just wait just just so i'm clear you mean writers who end up producing good work they get on with the process of just doing the work of getting the writing yeah. Yeah. done well and they don't think yeah. so much about the business part of it until that work is done yeah as well, well as yeah or they done. know that the work has to get done you know and and then that the business part will be is of less you know those things will fall into play like and I, you know obviously some successful writers are very into the business and, and, and know a lot about it and you know and follow it in great detail but you know, you don't need to have that level of knowledge either, um, but you do need to get the work done, um, and that's first and foremost, I think. You know, and and that's always the case. And I think also writers need to empower themselves to know that if I do this work, then I can make call make more. I will that will empower me. That will I will be in a better position to call the shots because. People will be coming looking for me and my work because I've given the work the time and the attention that it needs, and people will recognise that. But it, um, yeah. But uh, the point I had been <laughs> trying to make was, you know, that for writers also to understand that, you know, the people involved in literary magazines are, you know, are. And the people involved as working as agents and the people involved in publishing, I think you know they're all they're all interested in in getting good new writing. You know that's what we want first and foremost. So that's why again it's why it's important to focus on the work. But and then but we are there once you have the good work ready for we once that they're ready for us, then you know I think this whole infrastructure is set up in order to kind of um, engage with the writer and with the work and bring that to readers. Well, I have enjoyed talking with you. I appreciate all of your time and all of your insights. And this has been an enormously helpful conversation. And I think it is important work that you're doing and it's important work that will need to continue to be done, especially in support of the form of the short story, poetry, to keep these things going and to keep yeah. the work. And I'd love to and... see people set up more magazines. I mean, I think definitely if you're in an area where, um, you know, there aren't, there aren't a good, you know, isn't a good literary magazine already at work. Um, but also I think people, you know, people have set up magazines here in Dublin in, in kind of, in reaction to what we do as well, you know, or, you know, and then niches have started to kind of form as well. And, you know, so there's a kind of, and it becomes a much richer, more vibrant scene where, and then, you know, writers know that the different magazines are publishing different types of work. So it's, it's you know, it all helps. 
So even if it's, you know, there is a magazine, but it, it's only publishing a certain type of writer, writing or type of, type of writer, well, then there's probably a place for another magazine to work alongside it as well, you know, so that's the exciting thing too. Well, Declan, I appreciate the time uh, and I look forward to seeing whatever you guys come up with next or in the, in the you know, the months and years ahead. And I wish you all the best with it. I don't know. I guess with the magazine, the the publishing imprint, that's it. There's nothing else. You guys, you guys have a podcast. I mean, you guys have different. There's different tentacles <laughs> to yeah, this yeah, operation. Yeah, yeah, we have, we have, yeah, we have. Uh, yeah, so a lot, like a lot of our activity has moved on, moved online. As in, and also that we've had resort. You know, because we now have more resources, it means that we can. We started publishing. Um, additional stories online as well and uh, so original like new stories will appear on the website every month um and they, they're not in the in the magazine and then we've been we've kind of added our whole archive from the first from you know from the from the 25 years and um like those very early issues we had to scan them to in order to you know make the to to be able to have a digital archive of them but yeah so all of that is on the website as well now and yeah so publishing original work on there as well which we have again thomas morris is, is involved in, in kind of in the work and we have a reviews editor as well we moved our book reviews from within the magazine to online as well so yeah so it's, it's all changing as we go yeah whatever right. makes sense of life <laughs> that's right that's right well listen i appreciate it it's great to talk with you and to meet you and i wish you well Thank you very much, Brian. Thank you.